Most people know about Pangaea, but were you aware that there were a total of six major supercontinents in Earth's history? Cool, right? But it gets more interesting. Supercontinents were at least partially responsible for global glaciation events, and ultimately the evolution of complicated life forms. That got your attention, didn't it? Before we dive deep into the history of the supercontinents, we need to briefly touch on plate tectonics. The lithosphere is the outer layer of the Earth, often called the crust in colloquial terms, and ranges between 100 and 150 meters thick. It is broken up into chunks, often called plates, that float on the asthenosphere, a semi-molten layer of the mantle. There are two main types of crust, continental and oceanic. Continental crust is thicker, but much less dense, whereas oceanic crust is thinner and denser. This is important because the plates aren't static. They collide with each other, and the oceanic crust will always subduct beneath the continental plates. This means that there are bits of the continental crust as old as 4 billion years old, but the oldest oceanic crust is a mere 180 million years old. The problem with this is that the oceanic crust is key to understanding how and when supercontinents formed. As the oceanic crust expands and drifts apart, particles within the cooling lava orient to align to the Earth's magnetic field. Once the lava cools into rock, it leaves a record of this. The magnetic north and south poles switch places over time, so bands of the oceanic crust headed outwards from a rift zone reflect this and leave an important historical record. And being able to match oceanic crust across the expanse of oceans helps us to figure out how the supercontinents came together, how they were oriented, and how they broke apart. However, during periods of mountain building that occur as two plates crush together, some bits of oceanic crust can detach and get stuck on the continental crust in a process known as abduction. Analyzing these bits of oceanic crust provides important clues such as whether that area was on the interior or exterior of a particular supercontinent. In short, the only way to look back into the history of supercontinent formation is to analyze thousands of rock fragments and create models based off the results. The first supercontinent was Ur. It formed 3 billion years ago. Billions of years ago when the Earth formed, the mantle was much hotter and the sun cooler. As time went on, the sun warmed up and the mantle cooled. When the second supercontinent, Kennerland, was formed, it blanketed the hot mantle, keeping heat from escaping. The higher elevations caused by the mountain building, combined with the increased chemical weathering, resulted in decreased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the first snowball earth. The first snowball earth was actually a series of glacial and warming cycles referred to as the Huronian glaciations. The periods of glaciation reduced weathering, allowing carbon dioxide to build up, resulting in a brief warming period before the next glaciers descended. The Huronian glaciations were ended by the breakup of Kennerland. Mantle heat building underneath the supercontinent eventually caused it to rift apart. The sea invaded the continent, sending fingers of water in between the chunks of continental crust. The temperature mediation of the sea caused glacial melt and increased erosion and rainfall. Organic nutrients such as phosphorus and iron were free to flow into the ocean and became gourmet entrees for the phytoplankton there. The phytoplankton, in turn, released an enormous amount of oxygen and there was a proliferation of life. This was all put to a sudden end by the Vredefort impact, which is the largest verified impact crater on Earth. Ah, well. The evolution of complex life forms would just have to wait a bit longer. As the mantle cooled and the sun warmed, it changed the conditions necessary to create a snowball Earth. So when the next supercontinent formed 1.8 billion years ago, the climate remained relatively stable. This supercontinent is called Nuna by some and Columbia by others. So pick your favorite and run with it. Fun fact! The period between snowball Earths is known as the Barren Billion. Rodinia formed 1 billion years ago and saw the second snowball Earth, known as the Neoproterozoic glaciations. Rodinia is about as far back as scientists have been able to determine with any degree of certainty what the orientation of the continent was or how the plates were squished together. Advances in technology made this possible as recently as just a few years ago, but more about that in a bit. When Rodinia broke apart, ending the second snowball Earth, a second great oxidation event took place. This time, no inconveniently timed meteor impacts halted the boom of life and complicated life forms evolved. 
For a variety of reasons, subsequent supercontinents have not resulted in global glaciations, although there have been brief glacial periods. The next supercontinent was Pinotia, which formed about 650 to 500 million years ago. And following that was the famous Pangaea, which was hanging around 300 to 200 million years ago. This begs us to ask, how did these supercontinents form? And when and where will the next one be? What will it look like? Up until 2012, there were two major models for how supercontinents form, introversion and extroversion. According to the introversion model, after a supercontinent rifts apart, the plates eventually reverse their motion and come back together again, so the interior edges of the first supercontinent become the interior edges of the second supercontinent. Alternatively, the extroversion model has plates drifting all the way to the opposite side of the world to meet up again, so the interior edges of the first supercontinent would become the exterior edges of the second. Scientists hypothesized that supercontinents formed via both of these methods. For example, a publication in 2004 had Pangaea formed by introversion and Panosha formed by extroversion. That all got turned on its head by a new theory proposed by Ross Mitchell in 2012, orthoversion. This new model for supercontinent formation has plates following the edge of the ring of subduction around the previous supercontinent so that they meet 90 latitudinal degrees from where the previous supercontinent was located. According to orthoversion, the next supercontinent will be created by the closing of the Arctic Ocean. Mitchell calls this amasia. Orthoversion accounts for a lot of the holes in the previous models and has allowed new research to advance the study of supercontinent formation. Based on the orthoversion model, scientists and researchers use complex computer algorithms to analyze vast quantities of data about rock samples to quickly compile and compare data sets and determine the motion of tectonic plates millions or billions of years ago.